Oh, I'm excited about this morning's message. Uh, after first service, we had just an incredible response because I think it's a very real and intimate subject matter. Today, we're talking about failing forward because that sometimes in life, if you're not failing forward, you're standing still or you're moving backwards. And it happens. All of a sudden, you can see it in people's eyes. That something's happened. They, they've quit growing. That they've isolated themselves. They're finding themselves in selfishness and oftentimes oppression and depression. And all those words come into play. And so this message and these series of messages is really important. We're talking about failing forward. One of the things that uh, I, I've watched over the years because the Lord has enabled us to travel the world uh, and help families and parents. And oftentimes Pastor Shelley will be sitting with a young mother and She'll ask, well, how do you interact and how do you do this? And one of the things that happens, and we see it in today's world, oftentimes we see parents bribing their kids to be good. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, if you'll be good, I'll give you this. And Pastor Shelley says, our expectation of our kids is that you're always good. Come on now. It's okay to reward your kids, but don't reward them for adequate expectation that you expect of them all the time. You understand something. They're not going to get that in the workplace. Thank you so much for coming every day. We're going to give you a bonus today. And so oftentimes we're raising our kids, whether we believe it or not, to fail in the world as we know it today. And it kind of reminded me of a story about this very well-meaning uncle. You know, the well-meaning uncles, he didn't have any kids. And so he seemed to always give some of the best gifts at Christmas time. Well, it was none the case. He went out and bought a really fancy harmonica and gave it to his eight-year-old nephew, Josh. Well, he saw him about two months after Christmas, and he said, uh, Josh came up to him so enthusiastic, and he said, uh, Uncle Joe, I want to thank you. That harmonica was the best Christmas gift I have ever gotten. Uncle Joe was kind of amazed by his enthusiasm about this harmonica. He said, well, that's great, Josh. Uh, do you know how to play any songs on it yet? Oh, Josh said, I don't play it. In fact, my mom gives me a dollar every day not to play it, and my dad gives me $5 a week not to play it at night. <laughs> that's kind of the world that we live in, isn't it? If you have your Bible, turn me to Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse number 2. We're going to read for a little bit a story that you may be familiar with, talking about the sons of Adam and Eve. And it says, And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. It's an amazing account on so many levels because we have Adam and Eve who walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden, walked with God intimately. You have a second generation of people that are under sin, that are under disobedience. And how quickly in that sin things can go wrong. I don't think by any measure it was Adam and Eve's dream for their kids, for one of their kids to be a murderer. But nor do I believe that it was Cain's plan ever to be a murderer. You say, Pastor, how did it get to this place? We've been talking about blind spots. When we talk about failing forward, the thing that we have to recognize in our life is that everybody here has a blind spot. And blind spots always cause accidents. Okay, that was, thank you for that. Blind spots always cause accidents. 
And here's the accident that we're talking about today, or the blind spot. It is the blind spot of offense. See, when offense is present, we never fail forward. Uh, We fail, and when we fail, we leave a wake of tears and destruction behind us. See, very often, when we are offended, we can't get back on the right track. And when we look at this story, murder is the consequence of the offense. So how did Cain get so offended? Well, that's a great question. That we find them and he's doing something. He's bringing something to God. It says Abel brings the best and the first, but Cain brings something. Uh, At least he's trying. And, And on our level, with our humanity and our thinking, we think... Well, trying has to count for something. But what we misunderstand is this, is that God is always a first place God. Let let me say that again. If you understand the character and nature of God, God is always a first place God. He's never a second place God. He never takes the consolation prize. And then when we become his subjects and his servants, that all of a sudden our expectation is, well, he'll take whatever I give him, but we're asking God to change his nature, and it's impossible for God to change. And so now you have this situation where Cain is dejected and upset. He is offended both at God And both that is brother. And you say, why is he so offended? Because that word acceptance there, if we could replace that word with one word, we would use the word blessing. Because when you have God's acceptance, you have his blessing. How many of you here would like to have God's blessing today? When you have God's acceptance, you have his blessing. But all of a sudden something happens. There's an offense. And please don't tell me today that there's no danger in the victim mentality. Because Cain is a victim and he becomes a killer. Don't tell me there's no, there's no, there, there's no danger in that. So you say, how, how, do you, how do you deal with these things? Or why do we get so offended? What leads to these offenses? Well, first and foremost, there's pride. See, pride leads to justification of our actions and behaviors. Pride says... Hey, I gave something, at least I tried. There are other people in the world that aren't doing anything, but at least I did something. Why can't God accept me just for doing something? Pride's really dangerous because what pride does, it leads to a secondary ailment. You know what that secondary ailment is? It's jealousy. Because now we have this justification that leads to a sense of false entitlement. That this is what we believe whether we think so or not. That everything has to be fair and equitable for me. Uh, You know what? This was unfair. God, you, you have chosen Abel and you like him more than you like me. And this jealousy and pride now plays out. And now the jealousy and pride, there becomes rebellion and disobedience because what happens when all that comes into play, the next thing that comes into play is that I am the authority. And I don't even have to listen to God. Here here is God trying to warn. God is trying to warn Cain. And listen to this. God couldn't even talk him out of his offense. Isn't that incredible? You say, Pastor, how is that possible? Well, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you, like me, have been in church a long time? Can I tell you something? In church, I have seen quote-unquote Christian people do some things that you wouldn't believe would even happen in church. When I was a kid, there was a big church split, and all of our tires got slashed in the church parking lot. That People were mad at the preacher, so they came to church. And they opened their newspaper on the front rows of the, uh, of the church while he was preaching. In church. So don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't even begin to tell me that you, if God spoke to me, I could get over my fence. Listen, I've seen people come to church and hold on to their fence for a long time. You see, offense affects everything. 
It affects our marriage. It affects our children. It affects our relationships at work. It affects who we are, what we do. It affects our relationship with God. And so you say, Pastor, how do we overcome offense? How do we deal with it? Well, the first way that we deal with offense is, number one, is you have to be honest. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It's the hardest thing sometimes for church people to do. You say, church people. <laughs> yeah. Because all of a sudden, we come to church, and we want people to believe we're better than what we really are. It doesn't happen in the workplace because we let our hair down. When we get mad there, we just use all the four-letter words that we want to use. When we come to church, we're sanctimonious. We try to watch what we do, how we say, and we want everybody to believe that our marriage is good and our kids are perfect. Uh, let me in on a little secret. Your kids, <laughs> your kids ask for prayer requests up there in class. You're keeping your secret, but it's not a secret anymore. Because your kids are saying, pray for mommy and daddy. They fight all the time. Pray for us because daddy says we're going to the poorhouse. I, I mean, everything that they've heard and observed and that's touching their little hearts, at least they can be honest and say, pray with me about this. But all of a sudden, we get big and smart, and we can't be honest anymore. And offense is one of those areas, because all of a sudden, people say, I'm not offended. But everybody around knows you're offended. Right. Well, pastor didn't come see me, and I was in the hospital, and I'm coming to church. But, you know, I don't know what kind of pastor he really is. Can I tell you something? You're offended. And so now because of your offense, you're probably not going to hear what I'm trying to tell you today. Because I'm human. I make mistakes. But I, we're going to talk about this in a moment. One of the reasons we get offended is because we have unreasonable expectations. So first and foremost, we have to stop and just be honest. You know, Shelly and I, before we started this church 25 years ago, we worked for some great men of God. But I'm going to be honest with you. Every church that we worked for, I went away from that place offended at the pastor. And can I tell you something? I knew I was wrong. And so what I would do is this. I would get up in my morning prayer time and I would say, Lord, please help me, forgive me. I forgive them. Lord, I want everything to be good between us. And, and then by mid-afternoon, I would be thinking horrible thoughts about that guy. How, how many of you know I'm talking? And, and vindicating those thoughts like, well, you know what? If, it's, if they turn that church into a, a skating rink, that would be okay with me. Vindicating my offense and my feelings had nothing to do with the kingdom of God, had nothing to do with anybody else, had everything to do with me. And what I'm trying to tell you is this. As much as I prayed and much I asked for forgiveness and said I was forgiven, I was still offended. And I, I want to I wanna eradicate another myth. Time doesn't heal all wounds. I've been around this long enough and lived long enough that I have seen siblings. I have seen children that don't talk to their parents. Come on now. Over the stupidest stuff. Because there was an offense. And so as the people of God, we've got to learn how to deal with our offenses. And first and foremost, what we're going to have to be honest because you understand this, the word of God, Jesus says this. He said, you may not end up like Cain and physically murder somebody, 
But hear what he says in Matthew 5, 21. He says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So you say, Pastor, how do I recognize the symptoms of offense? Well, first and foremost, people who are offended are extremely discontent. Number one, they're discontent. Number two, often they're angry. Number three, they're critical. And number four, they can exhibit a lot of self-righteousness. And offended people tend to carry that proverbial chip on their shoulder. You know what I'm talking about. Where they come out of church and they say everything's fine. And as soon as they get on Fairmont Parkway and somebody cuts them off, all of a sudden they're ready to pull out their pistol and whip them and shoot them. Christian folk. Come on now. Just carrying this chip, waiting for somebody to knock it off. You know why? Because you've already been hurt. You've already been offended. And instead of coming to a place where, you know, I believe that, I believe in preventative prayer. We're going to get to that in a minute. I, I believe that there is preventative prayer, but there are symptoms that we can listen. The, the third thing that we can do that's preventative is that we can listen to God even when he speaks through others. You see, offended people, they can take a compliment the wrong way. Don't look at me like that. Some of you are married and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get offended at your wife or whatever, and the next thing you know, they're trying to make everything right and they say something and you take it completely the wrong way. How did that happen? Offense. See, offense, if we're not careful, can make us murderers. And so we have to come back and we have to listen to God, even when he's speaking through others. When somebody says, I can sense that you've been offended. Don't, man, don't put up the roadblock and say, no, I'm not offended. If you're offended, deal with it. Be honest and deal with it. Number four is you have to prepare your heart for offense and deal with it quickly. See, we have two kinds of pans in our house for two different kinds of cooking. We have these big old black cast iron pans. And man, they can cook some good stuff in those cast iron pans. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Love it. There's only one problem with the cast iron pans, cleaning them up afterwards. Do you know why? Because everything sticks. But we have these other pans. And you take these other pans and we have this little stuff in a can we call Pam. And we spray those eggs and that. You, put, you, you, do, you do scrambled eggs in the cast iron pan and it is a mess. You soak in that pan for hours because everything sticks to the cast iron. But you put it in that other Cephalon and you, you put that pan and you do it and you go to clean it up, it just goes. Whew. I like that. <laughs> you know, some people have cast iron hearts. And everything in life offends them. And it's just sticking. Everything sticks to them. I, I don't want to have one of those kind of hearts. I want to have a heart that's been applied with Pam that just, everything just slides off. Come on now. Just let it just slide off. Oh, that's okay. You, you understand something because we come to this next part and you have to understand this. The reason, the only way we can have that kind of heart is we have to deal with these false expectations that lead to disappointment. Here's the thing I want you all to understand. People always fail. Man, I've been doing this a long time, and I've done a lot of premarital counseling. And 
<laughs> the hardest premarital counseling are these young girls who have this preconceived idea that they're marrying Prince Charming and they're going to live this Cinderella life. And so for six weeks, I would sit down and try to convince them that Prince Charming was really a frog. And some of them I couldn't convince until later on they came to me afterwards and said, I didn't know he could make those kind of smells. <laughs> they get so frustrated. Okay, here's the man, the man thing. My wife is the same way. We've been married 33 years. You know, she'll say, she'll come into the toilet, into the toilet and there's no toilet paper on the roll. Anybody have this in their house? Three feet from, from, the, from, three feet from the toilet paper to the roll. Why can't you take the three feet and put it down? What, you know what makes her matter? It's when I make the three feet and set it right on top of the roller. <laughs> Don't act like I'm the only guy that does that. Two seconds to take that little deal off and put it on there, put it back on there. Amen. And it goes over, not under. She, she has so low expectations, that is not even a fight anymore. That's, that, that was gone a long, isn't it right? That's gone a long time ago. She just says, I'll just take care of it. Ain't no big deal. <laughs> See, when you have false expectations, li listen to me. Oftentimes, you can sacrifice people and bless them, and they never even see it. And because you have false expectations, you come back and say, don't they know all I've done for them? Don't they know all I've sacrificed for them? And here they are hurting me. How many of you have ever experienced that kind of hurt can I see you can I see your hand and we went into thinking okay it's going to be this way can I tell you the word of God says this do everything as if you're doing it unto the Lord do it unto the Lord you understand something he's the acceptor he's the blesser he he's the one I'm telling you he will not fail now I'm not saying you won't get offended by God that's a whole different thing because if you're not careful, God can offend you. In fact, Jesus even talked about it in his life and ministry because his cousin, John the Baptist, Jesus calls him the greatest man to walk the planet other than himself. I mean, John the Baptist, among men, there's no one greater than John. And John shut his ministry down. Jesus' ministry is blowing and going. And so John has this little boutique ministry. He gets arrested by Herod just because Herod likes what John says. And that one day he's in prison and he can't go anywhere. And so John sends Jesus a coded message. Anybody other than John ever send God a coded message? Like, you know what I'm saying here, God. I don't have to say it out loud, but you know what I'm saying. Because he's in prison. He doesn't want to be in prison. And so John sends this coded message that says, If you are the really, are you really the Messiah? Hey, go ask Jesus, are you really the one we've been looking for? In other words, if you are who you say you are, are you going to get me out of this mess I'm in? And Jesus answers John back and he says this. And he answered him, Go tell John, this is the NET. What you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. And listen to this. This is the NET. Blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Because here's one of the unreasonable expectations in life. You ready? Number one, life's not fair. Somebody say amen. And number two, you don't always get what you want. 
That's a false expectation even in the Christian walk. You don't always get what you want because we have a Father who gives you what you need. He de- that, that doesn't mean he doesn't bless you sometimes with what you want. My kids, when they were little, Jonathan would eat, eat candy 24-7 if we'd let him. And by now, he would have been obese, diabetic, and had no teeth in his head. But as parents, what we said, because we loved him, you're not going to do that. Well, he wanted to do that all the time. And sometimes we act like little kids and say, I want to eat Lucky Charms all the time. And God says, you're not going to eat Lucky Charms all the time. I'm about to give you some good stuff. I don't want good stuff. Yeah, but it's going to make you stronger. I don't want to go stronger. See, God wants the best for your life. He desires, he's a good father, not a benevolent grandfather. Amen? So the last thing we have to do is pray. But prayer is not just talking but listening. I came across this passage of Jesus. He's, he's on the Sabbath. He's preaching. Uh, and all of a sudden, this guy comes in with a deformed hand. And Jesus heals him. I mean, it's miraculous. This guy is born with this deformed hand. You can imagine this creative miracle that happens in front of everybody. And people got mad and offended at him. Because he's performed a miracle for a man with a deformed hand on the wrong day. Offended at Jesus because he did something good at the wrong time. In Luke 6, 11, it says, At this the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. Verse number 12, no, no break here. One day soon afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Why do you think he prayed all night? Because here he is doing good things for people every day that are trying to kill him. That's got, that's got to be highly offended, offensive. How many believe that's highly offensive? He didn't have to work up miracles. He's the son of God. People say, well, he prayed so he could have miracles. No, he didn't, he didn't have to work up miracles. But in his human side, here he is doing good for people. All The words God says he's doing good all the time. And he healed them all. And they're doing nothing but getting offended and wanting to kill him. How did he handle it? It says, and he prayed all night. See, failing forward is allowing God to deal with the condition of our hearts, then growing and maturing from the offense. And so the question is, are you learning? Are you learning and growing? Well, I came across this this morning. And they're quotes they've taken from a variety of different people at different ages, both boys and girls and men and women. And as I came across them, I thought, this, this is what these folks have learned. And it's all the way from age 7 to age 93. You ready? Age 7. I learned that our dog doesn't want to eat broccoli either. <laughs> age 12. I learned that just when I get my room the way I like it, mom makes me clean it up again. Age 14. I learned that if you want to cheer yourself up, you should try cheering someone else up. Age 15. I learned that although it's hard to admit it, I'm secretly glad my parents are strict with me. Boundaries. Security of boundaries. Age 24. I learned that silent company is often more healing than words of advice. Age 29. I learned that wherever I go, the world's worst drivers have followed me there. Age 30, I learned that if someone says something unkind about me, I must live so that no one will believe it. Age 42, I learned that there are people who love you dearly but just don't know how to show it. There's an expectation. Did everybody hear that one? That's a good one. I learned that there are people who love you dearly but just don't know how to show it. Age 46, I learned that the greater a person's sense of guilt, the greater his or her need to cast blame on others. Age 47, 
I learned that children and grandparents are natural allies. <laughs> Age 51. I like this one. This is an American proverb here. I learned that you can tell a lot about a man by the way he handles these three things. A rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree lights. <laughs> Age 58. I learned that making a living is not the same as making a life. Age 61, listen to this. I learned that if you want to do something positive for your children, work to improve your marriage. Age 64, I learned that you shouldn't go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. You need to be able to throw something back. Age 66, I learned whenever I decide something with kindness, I usually make the right decision. Age 72, I learned that everyone can use prayer. Age 82, oh, here you go. How many of you, how many of you are entering the age of 75 and above if you're willing to raise your hand? My, my mother-in-law's here. She's about to turn 80 in just a, just a few weeks. We're going to all wish LaVon a happy birthday, aren't we? Here, here's 82. I learned that even when I have pains, I don't have to be one. Age 92, I learned that I still have a lot to learn. See, we need to not just pray, but we also need to pray with understanding. Because our idea of success and God's idea of success are two completely different things. See, God is more interested in my growth in me than he is my circumstance. You know, honestly, I, I said this in first service. I told Shelly... We were going through something a couple of years ago. And I said, you know, had God wrote a book about my life when I was 20 years of age and handed it to me and said, okay, this is what I'm going to teach you and this is how I'm going to teach you, I don't think I would have signed up. But in his rich grace and mercy, in his timing and seizing through valleys, mountaintops, you know, everybody's all for the mountaintop, but nobody talks about how hard it is to get there. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, I've been there. A couple of years ago, I went elk hunting with our pastor up there in Idaho, uh, and I made a big mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Because I got there, and I said, where are the horses? He said, we don't have horses. I said, where are the ATVs? We don't have ATVs. I said, where are the elk on top of the mountain? How are we going to get there? Walk. How far is it? Three and a half miles or two and a half miles straight uphill. I said, okay, well, that ain't no big deal. I'm from Houston. We're, we're below sea level. We're now at way above sea level. And, and the first day up the mountain, I said, ah, I quit. <laughs> Second day of the mountain, I would have quit too, but Pastor Gary was there behind me saying, come on, get up the hill, get up the hill, get up the hill. And, and I got up the hill, and I was so happy. Just in time to go back down the hill. <laughs> and all the way down the hill, only thing I could think is, I've got to do this again tomorrow. Oh. And I learned something. You know what I learned? I'll never do this again. <laughs> but life's full of valleys, and valleys are wonderful. Flat places where you can walk and breathe. Lots of room to spread out. And he blesses us in those seasons of valleys. Then we come to the hills and then the foothills and then the mountain. And going, and it's harder, it's rough. The going is rough. But he's got this plan. He's changing us into his character and nature. He's infusing in us love and mercy and grace. Things that aren't innate in us. See, and we have to have a God vision in our prayers. Let, let me wrap this up. Jesus taught us to pray this way. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And one of the inevitable things that's going to happen in life every day is there's going to be an opportunity to be offended. Let me say that again. I've got one amen over there. There's something that's going to happen every day is there's going to be the opportunity to be offended. Offended. 
And can I tell you something? You will never grow spiritually till you can overcome your offense and quit being offended. Because people can't speak truth to you. Because anytime somebody tries to speak truth in your life, you get offended. Even people who love you, speaking truth to your life, you get offended. And before long, you now have a short list of people that say the right things around you, but don't enable you to grow. And this is how we live our life, and we call it peace, but we're angry and we're upset and we're discontent because we've been so offended that we're now caring and everything sticks to us. We go to work and it sticks to us. And so we change jobs or we change churches or we go change marriages because we don't want to be offended. Can I tell you something? Offense is a part of life. And we better learn how to deal with it. We better learn to be honest and say, man, I'm offended. And there are some of you here today, truth be known, that this message is for you. Because you understand something, you're not a murderer, but you're killing your marriage. You're not a murderer, but you're killing your kid's future. Because the offense is so stuck inside of your heart that all of a sudden you have this chip going on and everything in life is now an offense to you. You come to church and you're offended. You go to work and you're offended. Everywhere, every place you see, you are offended. You have to be honest. But even more importantly, this is what happens. The spirit of truth comes and then he's honest with us. Because what he says is this. He doesn't buy into our excuses our justifications, why we are the way we are, why we hold to what we hold to, he just comes and says, you're wrong. See, we like to hold to all of our arguments. Well, this is the reason why that I am this way. And man, I've been done bad. Nobody else. This is horrible. It, it may be. But the spirit of truth comes and says, this is your issue. I'm, I'll take care of them, you take care of you. Let me take care of this inside of you. See, if some of you have families that are splintered. Some of you have spiritual things that are going on because of offense in your life. And today I'm telling you, you will never fail forward until first and foremost you deal with the offense in your heart and life. Will you bow your heads with me? Today's the day where we're honest in church. Today's the day. Today's the day where we put aside our self-righteousness and our spiritual pretense. We lay them by the wayside today. And we just, we're just honest. And that honesty begins with me today. And it begins with you to say, Pastor, I'm dealing with offense. If that's you, will you raise your hand right now and say, I'm dealing with offense in my heart. I'm dealing with it. I want you to sense what's happening, just raising your hand and being honest, what the Holy Spirit's doing in you. That honesty works. It works in you. Just keep your hand up for a moment. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, you see every hand. And Jesus, you said, I've come for the brokenhearted. And that's what happens when we're offended. We're broken. We don't know how to heal. We don't know how to mend ourselves. But Lord, you said that you've come for us. There are many times, Lord, I've come with my excuses just like these folk here today. And I've said, Lord, I've been done wrong on every level. And yet I'm reminded I have not been crucified. And yet even as you were on a cross with every right to be offended with all of humanity and their sin, you said, Father, forgive them. Lord, we're honest enough to say it's not in us. We don't, we don't have that type of righteousness, but in you we do. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to begin this healing process in us because we're being honest with it. 
We want recon reconciliation. Lord, we want healing inside of us. We want wholeness inside of us. We want you to come and work forgiveness through us that we're not bitter and angry and upset. We're not carrying this chip on our shoulder waiting for somebody else. Lord, that we can allow that spiritual Pam to be, to be sprayed upon our heart. And Lord, we can be free as you've called us to be free. So Lord, I pray over every hand right now. Lord, mend marriages, mend relationships between moms and children and dads and children. Mend these relationships supernaturally, I pray. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. If you'll remain in your seat and every head bowed and every eye toed, uh, closed for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Allen, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. But today, I want everything to be made right. I want to be accepted by him. I want to be loved and blessed, as you spoke of. If that's you, will you raise your hand right now? I want to pray with you as well. Lord, bless you. Thank you. I, we had several people in first service, and many of them came to me afterwards. And one lady came forward and said, listen, I've, I, I've done this. I made a decision. I want to be baptized. And we're going to baptize her, and that may be you today. So let's, let's just pray. Lord, we come, and the first admission we have is we're sinners. We don't hold to anything other than that. Lord, we're sinners, and we have sinned, and we have failed others, and we have failed you. And that's where we want to stop today, Lord. We don't want to fail you anymore. We can't do it on our own, and we don't want to do it on our own. We surrender our life, our future, our way to you, Jesus. We ask that you take hold of our life, that you teach and show us, that you grow us, that Romans 8:28 can be our life scripture, that all things now are working together for your good, for your purpose, for your plan. So, Lord, let that be applied to our life today. And we, we're believing you're doing that in us today, that you're changing our life. And in so changing our life, you're changing everything about our life, our future, our marriage. You're changing it all right now. In Jesus' name, amen.